I mean, going through school, I was never that academic. Um, so I never really had any vision of what I wanted to do. Colin is the founder of Bob and Birth, which opened in 2013 in Port Stewart. I had a look at it and I thought, you know, I've, I've had a crossroads here. I either keep on doing this, which I knew would break me. At that moment, about 2011, 2012, I thought this all has to come into one brand. The name gives the brand a bit of personality, you know, and we're quite lucky we've got two names. Customers are coming in and I thought this is all wonderful. I had no idea if we're making profit or not. How do you please your customer? Listen to what they want and make it happen. So that, that's what we did. People open business because they want to be make a difference. So if that's the real driving factor, you'll be okay. Um, so just always, we always ask ourselves why in Bombers? Why are we doing things, you know? Turned over £260 on its first day. He's not afraid to tell us that. But 10 years later, Bob and Berth has 27 sites and has reached a turnover of £23 million. Those are some figures to talk about. And such a, a, a big change from the start to the finish. But we'll hear all about that um, as the podcast unfolds. But it's been one hell of a journey and one which at times... Colin admits wasn't strategically planned. However, as expansion crept in, Colin began to put systems and measures in place to protect the brand, first of all, and also expand beyond his wildest dreams. So I want to know, and I want I know you'll all want to know as well, how that growth happens, how you manage it, and what can Colin tell us about retail, customer experience, growing a brand, growing a team, and ultimately allowing yourself to dream big. I'm going to ask him all the juicy questions today and I'm honoured that he said yes to be a guest on the Dig Podcast. So welcome to Dig Podcast, Colin. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I know you didn't know it was like visuals as well as audio, but uh, welcome to the Dig Podcast madness. So uh, we like to be able to just people to see who they're talking to as well. So I uh, appreciate you being here. I know you've had a long journey, but I kind of give a wee bit of an instruction there, but there's nothing like hearing it from you and those are just very like skimming the surface. Do you want to tell us a wee bit? I already know this from our conversation, but how this all started. Like you're still only 43, you know, you won't mind me telling that because you told me that on the phone, but like to have achieved all of this, where did it actually start? Yeah, well, it's very difficult to actually pinpoint where it all kind of started, but I suppose the journey that I've been on um, from leaving school and going across university and becoming a teacher and opening a clothing store, I know you wouldn't think that looking at me today. I'm not a... Um, I'm a what do you call it, a fashion icon as such, but uh, yeah, going through that and then ended up in hospitality, it was never it was never planned. So it sort of fell into quite a few different um, sort of jobs and different sort of brands and different kind of things we've done over the years. So you started off, you were a teacher, but then you opened a clothes shop while you were teaching. Yeah. And that clothes shop was Eden Park, I think you were wearing that brand when you came yeah. in today. I love that brand. Um so how did that happen? Like, how do you be a teacher and then decide to want to open a clothes shop? Yeah, well, I mean, going through school, I was never that academic. Um, so I never really had any vision of what I wanted to do. Um, but I ended up being pushed in the direction of everybody has to be university. That seemed to be the, the mantra of the late 90s. Go to university, get a degree, get a job. And uh, I fell into that. Um, so I went and did business and French university, um, which I failed. So the university said, thanks for coming. Um off you go back to Northern Ireland. <laughs> but I managed to get myself into the geography, which again, random, and had no real desire to be a geographer or a teacher or anything, but I did geography. And long story short, at the end of that, people kept asking me, what are you going to do? So the natural progression was become a teacher. So I did that um, for about five years, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. But again, it was never my dream, so no real passion for it. I enjoyed doing it, loved my time being a teacher, but just didn't have that passion. So I suppose the job I got was in a, in a private boarding school in West Yorkshire, um, near Leeds. And part of the, the deal for me living in, looking after 60 boys, which is no mean feat when you're 22 years of age, looking mm -hmm. after 60 um, sort of 17, 18 year old boys in a, in a boarding house. Um, they gave me a Thursday off. So on my Thursday off, I had gone into Leeds, major city in the north of England. And I just loved the whole sort of buzz of the city centre. I loved the whole kind of walking around, see what's happening, coffee shops, retail, all sorts of different things going on. It was just, it was amazing for me. So teachers will probably laugh at this, but I got a little bit bored being a teacher. There's so much to do, but I thought, because I'm off on Thursday weekends, I could do so much more. So I had this mad idea of opening my own business and I didn't have any idea what that would be. Would it be hospitality? Would it be retail? Would it be something else? But 
I came across Eden Park, which is a clothing brand, a French clothing brand actually, who didn't have very many stores in the UK. I think we had two at the time, one in London and one in, I mean in Belfast actually randomly. But um, I got in contact with them and went and met the owners and they offered me a franchise, which I took into uh, Leeds. And I opened that store and again, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea about design of stores, I had no idea about retail. I'd never worked in retail, I'd never had a job, I'd never used a till before. So it really was, how about I say I'm a comfort zone, but it was really cool. And I sort of like fell in love with that kind of like the idea of taking a product, which in this case was clothing, and bring it to a new market, which was Leeds. So after uh, a number of years of teaching and running Eden Park, Something had to give. I mean, quite simply, I was working seven days a week. And there's loads of people listening to the podcast. And I know because I speak to business owners all the time that are listening, that are trying to juggle their full time job with their side hustle or their dream of business. What would you say that that is very, very hard to give your all to everything? Yeah. And what I found was, I mean, I was, I was teaching a class and I had two laptops, one for the the class that I was taking and one I was watching the till system and I was putting orders in for the shop, for Eden Park and all that kind of stuff. And you're quite right, you can't give 100% to both. So to me, I was forced into making the decision because my staff were actually getting paid more than I was at one point. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, you know, I could probably go and do that and work in retail full time, but I didn't want to take the leap because I had this sort of, I had a salary, I had a good salary teaching. I lived in the school as well. I got all my food paid. I got my ironing done. I got ev everything you can think of was being done for me. So to walk away from that is quite a difficult decision, but I knew I had to. And recruiting staff and training staff, I just couldn't give it my all. So I ended up then sending myself right. You need to get, either pick one or the other. And I could leave teaching, but I definitely couldn't get a release for a shop. So again, I was forced into going into Eden Park full time. And and that's what I did after five years teaching. I gave it up. I went into it full time. And whenever we talked earlier, you talked to me about the things that you did to make your shop stand out. And you were like ahead of your game before we were all trying to embrace this. Um, I talked to you about influencer marketing. So you were doing it in a different kind of way, but it's still the same concept. Tell us what you were doing to make your shop stand out. We haven't even got to Bob and Birch yet, but this is all part of building like your skills, I suppose. But what did you do that made your shop stand out when no one else was really doing that? Yeah, well, look, Eden Park at the time, as I said, was unknown brands in the UK. So I sort of had the theory of how can we get the name out there? How can we get people being seen to wear it? And everybody was kind of wearing all our competitors' clothing, like Ralph Lauren and Gant and all that good stuff, which is amazing. But I wanted people to understand that there was Eden Park and you could buy it in Leeds. So... I sort of identified four or five sort of personalities or influencers, you know, in, in the rugby world. And I went along to them and said, look, there's a budget, there's a, there's a couple of jumpers, there's a couple of jackets. Would you wear it for me when you're doing interviews, when you're walking around rugby clubs, etc.? You know, so they did that. And looking back on it now, I think I had about five or six people who I gave free clothes to. And everyone kept saying to me, you're mad doing that. You're just giving away clothes, you're giving away money. But what I found was people then looking at these guys going, Flip, that's a nice jumper, or that's nice. I like the logo, where's that from? They would inquire, ask questions, and then we'd pick up business that way. And for me, that's one of the real drivers for me in Eden Park was I ended up using that to get into loads of rugby clubs, which Eden Park sort of identifies with in terms of its heritage. So I ended up then being able to um, loosely sponsor about five or six different uh, rugby clubs in the Yorkshire area. Um, in terms of clothing the entire team from head to toe in Eden Park, from jeans to genos to shirts to whatever. And that really then drove the kind of, you know, they were ambassadors for us. Um, and if you have a first team in a club, the second team look up to it, the third team look up to it, and they want to aspire to be that. So they were getting in touch with me asking, Flip, can I buy this? Can I get involved in this? And that's really early day influencer type uh, strategy that I had. It's always been there, I suppose, but um, it's this new trendy name for it now, like influencer some marketing, but, you know, it was such a, a kind of novel way back then to to do that when it probably wasn't um, as trendy among retailers to be giving mm. stuff away for free, but you could see the, the benefit of that and it definitely worked. And then you sold your, someone asked you, could they buy your shop? Wasn't that right? Wasn't that a yeah, yeah. So once it was there full time, uh -huh. um, I got to know our customers very well because I was there all the time and uh, a customer would come in and said he wanted a bit of help. Could he open an Eden Park in Manchester? And it turns out he lived in Leeds. 
And I jokingly said, well, sure, I'll sell you this one. And he said, okay, well, how much do you want for it? And it was literally over the sort of till point I said this. And he said, okay, that's fine. Well, can I cut, like that's their frames, <laughs> the dressed up frames are made up, but that's amazing to, you know, have that opportunity, I suppose, so early on in your career to get that like big sale. Mm -hmm. So I think I was 26 at the time and uh, yeah, I just sold it and it was, the deal was done within about 12 weeks. So I find myself going from a full-time teacher to being full-time in business to being essentially unemployed because it's all a business and nothing else to do. And I think this was around April time, so there's no teaching jobs coming up. Um, so yeah, it was a strange situation to be in. And then what happened? So I I met my wife in a university in Newcastle, mm -hmm. uh, upon Tyne, and she's from Ballymena randomly. So out of all the people in England, I met a Ballymena woman. Meant to be. Meant, meant to, be. to be, yeah. <laughs> and um, we came home actually just after I sold the business uh, at April time. And we came home and my parents lived up the North Coast and we went to Poor Russian Poor Stewart and we lived in the north of England, which is quite industrial and just not very pleasant to live in, in some of the places we lived in. Um, we sort of fell in love with the North Coast. Um, and I said to my wife, look, now is the opportunity for us to come back here. You know, I've left Hitchin, I've sold Eden Park. Um, my mum and dad had a couple of cafes at the time up in the North Coast. So I said, sure, you know, now is the opportunity for us to come back if that's what you want to do. But my wife had her own job. She's a, she's a lawyer, she's a solicitor, and she's employed full time. And um, she said, yeah, let's do that. Let's make it work, you know. So we've been in England, I think, at that time, about eight or nine years. Um, so, yeah, we're keen to get back. And then when he came back, like, he then opened a cafe in, or a bakery in Port Stewart. Yeah. Or Port Stewart. Port Port Stewart. Yeah. yeah, so just just as uh, we were having that conversation, as I said, my mum and dad had a few cafes in the North Coast and one came up for sale on the promenade. Um, the lady who owned it was a little small bakery. I had about, I think maybe about 10 seats from memory, not that big. But her son, who was the baker, was emigrating to Australia and she just sort of had enough and um, got speaking to her one day and she was like, look, I'm, I'm selling this and my dad had been speaking to her as well and you're a little bit. So we ended up doing a deal to, to, to buy that bakery and uh, that was in the promenade and we moved back very quickly after that, I think a few weeks later, back to Northern Ireland, uh, live with my mum and dad for about nine months, which was interesting times. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I basically worked day and night, both in the in the little bakery and my dad's place, really sort of cutting my teeth in hospitality, because again, I had no real experience in it. And then one wasn't enough, was it? No, so, well, um, we had the bakery and my dad had his own place as well, but he was sort of coming to the end. You know, my dad was about to retire, so um, I really enjoyed it. And I was sort of deep end. I mean, I my first sort of job when I came back after being a teacher and having my own business, was I worked in the, the dishwashing area, and that's all I did for weeks on end. Um, so I really got to know the business from the bottom up um, in terms of working at dad's place, but the, the bakery bit as well, that was where the innovation came from, you know? So although I was doing all the kind of like working the dishwasher and clearing tables and running food, doing the innovative piece in the bakery and making sure that we had a, a new coffee machine, a new till system, all the kind of things you need and require, that's where I really sort of learned the trade of hospitality and what the customer expects. And then what, when did the itch come? You thought, right, I'm, I'm going to open another one after that. Yeah, so just getting to know people through, I suppose, serving them as, as customers. You get opportunities and people get to know you. They either like your personality or they, or they like what you're doing. They, you get offered things all the time. You know, people want to offer you different products or, in my case, landlords are saying, look, I've got a product up the road to be interested. And, and that's really what happened. So a, a guy came into me who had an O'Brien's franchise in Porsche Promenade, but he also had a Subway franchise. And Subway found out they had O'Brien's and they wasn't allowed to have both. So he said to me, Colin, I need rid of this really quickly. Will you take it? And without seeing the books or the rent or anything, I said, yeah, absolutely I will. So I took that on. Um, and that was like a, a coffee shop type sandwich bar. So I had O'Brien's for a few months, but very quickly I thought, look, it's a franchise operation. I'm not interested in it. I want to do my own thing. So very quickly, we ended that relationship and uh, I just carried on independently of O'Brien. So it was called Bentley's and we ended up having about four or five different Bentley's across the North Coast. And as I said to you before, one was a bakery, one was a coffee shop, one was like a sandwich bar coffee shop and one had like a hot food element to it. So like a, like almost like a cafe. So we're, we're, I was actually operating five operations. It was very difficult to operate five different types of business. So 
Um, I had a look at it and I thought, you know, I've, I've had a crossroads here. I either keep on doing this, which I knew would break me because there wasn't the underlying kind of skills to run five operations or bring it all into one. And that's where the sort of, I had that moment about 2011, 2012, I thought this all has to come into one brand and one operation. And that's really where Bombers comes from. It's a combination of those five different types of operation into one. So they're like, um, uh, again, I always say there's people listening and they're trying to do so many things and wear so many different hats and so many different elements. And then you can lose, like what you talked about when we talked previously, your brand values and your yeah. the reasons what you stand for. So you saw that and then brought it all under the one umbrella. And then I asked you why it's called Bob and Burt's and I was waiting for like this big explanation. But why? But there is actually an underlying like ethos behind Bob and Burt. Yeah. So well, what does that mean? Well, Bob is the kind of quite conservative guy. You know, he's a sort of more serious one. And in business, you have to be a bit serious at times, you know. So he's the kind of more conservative, more serious um, type of guy. And Bert's more flamboyant. So he's the one that kind of like goes and does the kind of like way out there things, like opens five or six stores a year. Or if there's ever a mistake in Bob and Bert's, you know, social media, we always pin it on him, you know. She is. You're Bert, aren't you? Well, no. <laughs> I think you're Bert. Yeah, but we definitely have that personality and that, yeah. that's why it works well, you know. So the name gives the brand a bit of personality, you mm-hmm. know, and we're quite lucky we've got two names, you know, Bob and Bert, we can sort of play off that, so, yeah. Because you've got a Bert burger and a Bob burger and everybody. We do, yeah, we do, yeah. And then the logo is like a little speech bubble. So, again, just at that time, I'm of the generation where iPhones were just coming out. And if you remember, I think it still is a case now, if you send an iMessage, there's like a little kind of like a speech bubble appears at the very bottom. Uh-huh. And that's where it comes from. So it was all about, you know, having that speaking, that meeting place, that kind of conversation. So that's where the speech bubble comes from in, in, the, in the logo. The Dig podcast would not be possible if it wasn't for the support of the fantastic partners who team up with us each series. Series 6 is in partnership with Invest NI, my new business. Mia was starting a new business and needed financial assistance and advice. She visited My New Business and accessed a directory of local support schemes. From grants and loans to advisory support, there was help available for her specific needs. Need help starting your new business? Visit nibusinessinfo.co.uk slash mynewbusiness. Now let's get back to making it happen. And you then, like... Things moved really fast then, didn't it? So you'd like, we brought them all under the one umbrella and if I'm right in saying you'd like four or five at that stage when that happened. And well, then... Yeah, at four or five Bentleys. So I yeah. kind of sold a couple of those off because I couldn't operate them and then I really focused on Bob and Burr's. So we opened the first one in June 2014, sorry, 2013. Um, so we're 10 years open this year on the product in Port Stewart and the reception we got just was mind-blowing because what we did there was we took the best elements of all the sort of five operations I had previously. So the bakery bit, um, I took all the sort of freshly baked products. So Bob and Birds still bakes off their own scones every morning, their own croissants, all the kind of like bakery stuff is done every morning in the store. And um, we have the coffee shop element as well. So when you walk into Bob and Birds, it's that kind of like line up, order the till type operation, um, which is the coffee shop. And then we had the sort of the hot food, the full kitchen element. And that, for me, really sets us apart from our, our competitors. So although we say we're a coffee shop, um, first and foremost, that's what we are. Our main sort of unique selling point as such is we have this great, vast kitchen at the back that does all this amazing food, all day breakfast and burgers and all sorts, which is very different from the sort of traditional coffee shop. It certainly is. And you can see that when you go in. But whenever th- that the growth then happened very quick because obviously Bob and Burt's was the buzzword and everyone wanted one nearly in every town. So mm-hmm. what, what, how quickly, what, how quick was that growth? What, what did that look like? Well, very quickly I could rebrand a couple of our stores that we had previously, Bentley. So um, the poor shirt one, sorry, we had the poor, poor rush next and that was uh, a guy who had a building who I think the banks were trying to take it off him for various reasons. They said, Colin, any tenant here, would you be interested? And I thought, well, look, We've won in poor shirts, we're going very, very well, it's seasonal, but fine. Opened in poor rush, and again, it went very, very well for us. So kind of building that relationship with customers who had a property was was quite good. And the same thing happened in Korean. Very quickly we opened in Korean, and we did that, um, mainly because I wanted to have an all-year-round uh, all round trade, because the poor rush and poor shirt, as you know, is very seasonal. So I got the opportunity in Korean, I thought, you know what, that's a good idea to keep the brand alive all year round because um, 
poor after poor shirts, right? So you get loads of influx of tourists and whatnot, but to make sure as well that we could share staff, give the sh- give the staff their hours in the winter because we struggled at the start, you know, because it's so busy in the, in the summer and so quiet in the winter. You know, what do you do with 30, 40 staff in a store and poor steward in the winter? Well, you either have to lay them off or you have to try and get them somewhere else to work. So that's why poor rush and then Korean works so well. And like none, no, um, I know you failed your business at school, at yeah. uni. Yeah. Like such a, a mind to run all of that. Like what were the challenges? Like well, well, the, the the reason why I failed business at uni was I just couldn't relate to the stories. Um, so you, you're being taught about the theory of business and you're being told about Nissan or these multi-global companies, you know, and you're being told that this is how they work. But I just could never comprehend the scale of it, you know. So that's why I could never understand business. But when you get into the sort of the basics, it's actually quite a simple concept. You know, you buy something at one price and okay, you've got a few other bits and pieces in between. But you sell the next and that's the profit in between. But the challenges of growing was was very difficult in terms of trying to make sure that you had a brand identity first and foremost. You had consistency in your brand. You had consistency in, in your in your staffing, your staffing level, and you had consistency in really, um, I suppose, hitting customer expectations. Because we get to a certain size, and three or four stores, people think, "Well, this is a big business." And three or four stores is a big business, but the customer expectation goes from. This isn't just call mess around in Port Stewart. This is now a business that we expect, you know, proper coffee, great grub. We expect good customer service. We have high expectations of the Wi-Fi, of the heating system, of all the kind of things that you kind of forget about. But that definitely then sort of hit home to me is people now expect a certain type of experience from Bumbert, so we need to match that pretty quickly. So what did you do? Um, we listened to our customers. First and foremost, so the first three or four stores had no heating, no air conditioning. Um, and we got complaints about it being too um, too warm in the summer, too cold in the winter. So we took the customer experience and said, right, we'll put heating in. So again, very, very basic. How do you please your customer? Listen to what they want and make it happen. So that, that's what we did. And right through to, you know, I suppose, speed of service. You know, people say, oh, I was in the Korean store. It wasn't as fast as Port Stewart. Why is that? Well, our equipment's not as good. So you have to invest in the equipment make it better, make it faster. So getting constant feedback. And in hospitality, that's one thing you do get, is constant feedback from customers. Um, you've got to take the chin. You have to ask, well, why are people saying that? Look at it and say, well, how can I make that better for our customer, for our staff, for our brand? Because if you don't fix it, it just becomes a bigger and bigger problem. And that's where if you don't fix something right now, in a couple of years' time, that problem's going to exist, be much bigger, and is out of control. No, I think a lot of people stick their head in the sand because sometimes changing things and making things better requires so much investment that you actually either ca- you know car away from it and don't and don't do it. But then your business suffers ultimately. But where did you get that courage to like say I am going to put the heat, like heating systems and air conditioning systems and all of that are expensive and all? But obviously you had the courage to do that. And I, look, you have to because. You, you end up hearing the same thing over again. Yeah. You don't want to hear it. You know, yeah. you don't want to hear that your shop's cold. You don't want to hear that your food's slow going out. You don't want to hear that your coffee machine can't cope. But ultimately, you do want a few things. If you don't fix it, you're going to end up losing customers because, as I said, hospitality is very fickle and people go elsewhere for various reasons. You know, down to the speed of Wi-Fi now. I mean, customers go places because it's warm, because the Wi-Fi is good, because it's got a, a, a certain chair they like or a certain table height. There's so many different variations and different things in hospitality that you have to listen to the customer. And it's moved on even 10 years ago. I mean, things we did 10 years ago in Bomb Birds, we just could not get away with now because the expectation of Bomb Birds and hospitality and coffee shops in general is so different to what it was back then. And you're saying like um, hospitality, the expectations are high, but across the board, people expect more now like in a retail shop now, for compared yeah. to when you had Eden Park, the things that people expect, like they want their Wi-Fi to work the minute they walk into a glow shop now. So there, I think that's for every business owner that's listening, the expectations, and rightly so, people deserve, you know, good customer experience and products are dearer now and they need to get the rewards for that in lots of different ways. But so things were changing, you were innovating and growing and where are we at now? How many showers um, are we talking about? We're probably a store three here. Um and bomb versus took off. I mean, we were being inundated. I mean, our Facebook page, which had just kind of started, social media only started then, 
was getting hundreds of likes, which was extraordinary for the size of business. But I was then being approached by people saying that this brand's amazing. Is this some sort of American franchise or to, did it come from England or where's this franchise from? And they were a bit shocked to hear it was actually started in Port Stewart by me. So people asked for franchises and having a little bit of franchise knowledge from the Eden Park days, I thought, well, this would be quite a good money spinner, you know? So sort of sat down with a few people here, approached me and said, look, I've never done it before, but let's try and we'll give it a go. So we came up with a, a franchise model and the next four stores we opened were all franchises. Um, and I got my eyes open there because we I definitely did not have the, the structure or the business wasn't refined enough to run a franchise. Um, and it was really, it was, a, it was a huge test and we learned loads from it. Um, but ultimately, over the next sort of three or four years after they opened, they all treated very, very well. But the battles I would have with franchisees around random little things like if, if Bob and Bruce were selling Coca-Cola, they want to sell Pepsi. You know, if they if we were selling Heinz of ketchup, they could get uh, an own brand cheaper and want to sell that. It was just a constant battle. And as I say, we weren't refined enough and didn't have a structure to really underpin that operation. So over the next sort of three or four years, we eventually bought them all back. Um, but it was a really steep learning curve for me. And ultimately, actually, it put us in a really good stead because what it did allow me to do was understand there's people joining this business or joining this brand who have no idea about hospitality, franchisees, but like me, had no idea about hospitality. So some of our staff joining have no experience whatsoever. So how do we articulate what we're trying to achieve in Bob and Birds was three pulling together things like operations manuals, like training documents and you know, simple things like I assumed that people knew how to web table. Very simple task. It would it would shock you, you know, that people don't know how to do that. <laughs> you know, and they'll they'll go and start your rubber table, but actually clear it all four corners and making sure they put the crumbs into their hand, not on the floor. All of those kind of little things that I thought people I assumed people knew. I found out actually people didn't know. So although the franchising thing didn't work for us in one sense, it really in the future really underpinned sort of the growth strategy for us. So once those um, franchise, once you got that all, you know, sorted and the franchises, you bought those back, isn't that right? Yeah. Um, so, and then more growth happened? Yeah. Um, and at that time, my, my brother-in-law, um, who's an accountant, um, he sort of had an interest in kind of like these new bar concepts and coffee shops up in London. And he'd be forward and back coming home and him and I always had an idea of opening like a restaurant in Poor Sturge, you know, selling like really cool cocktails and it's really nice bar. Neither of us have worked in a bar ever or served cocktails. So again, a bit of a bizarre one, but um, we got a site actually in Portia to do it and we couldn't get a plan permission and we couldn't get a drinks license. So I kind of fell through. And I said to David and brother, oh, look, Bond Burst is really taking off here. You know, we've got, uh, I think that's signed five or six sites, you know, do you want to come and join? And he did a very, very good job. He's an accountant uh, for one of the, the big four firms in London and he decided to give it all up, which again, I was surprised by. But um, so he came back and him and I then had this idea about more Bob and Birds. Um, and we randomly fell in with a guy who owns Minari's, the, the clothes store, uh, Stephen McCammon, who offered us. I think, good guy. I met him. I used to have a shop in Gannon, so it's yeah. lovely. Yeah, brilliant. And they're all over Northern Ireland and I think of a few in the South as well. Um, and he said to us, look, we have a real problem here in terms of we can't operate our, our coffee shops. Would you guys take it on? And they would have just joined and, you know, we said, yeah, absolutely, we did. So, again, we got four sites right away, um, which give us geographical spread. So, as far as Newton Ars, to Dungannon, um, and everywhere in between, Lisburn as well, we had the Minari store. So, that gave us a bit of geographical spread and really accelerated the growth. So, again, people were like, what is this Bob and Birds? You know, it's only been going a couple of years here. All of a sudden, they're popping up in Lisburn, Ars, Dungannon, all over the place, you know. So... The brand then got a bit of traction and uh, ultimately then we started opening our own sort of standalone stores too, myself and David, and we opened ones in Lisburn Main Street and Oma and Portadown High Street and, and the brand just really took off. Which how, many is, how many was that then when it got to that stage? Uh, so I think David joined around, I think it was six or seven sites and we're probably at site 13 or 14 now, yeah. Um, like this is a phenomenal growth story, like so quick. But yeah. but you did talk about how bringing people that knew what they were doing on board had yeah. that growth. So you couldn't do all this yourself. You didn't no. have the skill. No, absolutely. And and that's where that's where David is so important. So whenever he came in and say as an accountant, um, probably sees a bigger picture more than I would. 
he probably did a lot more strategic thinking than whatever it was. I was very much, you know, yeah, let's just go and do it. Whereas he was sort of asked the question, well, why do we want to do that? And have we thought about this and thought about that? And things that I just didn't really think about, you know? So we worked very well together in terms of that. And that's why I think Bob and Burst have been so successful because we have the two sort of skills and that I'm very kind of like out there and want to do things very quickly. He's kind of like, well, let's just think about it and let's go through the numbers and, you know, what do we need to make profit and all that? Because again, I didn't really know, you know, if we're making profit or not, it was it was good fun. Stores were opening, and customers were coming in. And I thought this is all wonderful. I had no idea if we're making profit or not. It's not unbelievable, but there'd be people listening and find that really, really hard to believe. But actually, when you're in the thick of your business, sometimes it's very hard to see what's actually going on because you're so busy. But yeah. um, like for someone at your scale to say that and be so honest, I think it's so good for people to hear because I think we're all. You know, you, you're wearing that many hats, as I said, and juggling it all. Very hard to know where where the profit lies. But but even now, I mean, in terms of reading balance sheets, reading accounts and all that, I, it, I, I don't have a clue. I asked David. He tells me he's an accountant, you know. So mm-hmm. in terms of profitability, in terms of margin, like, believe it or not, I think Bob and Birch was at site 16 before we knew where profit margin was on our dishes, wow. which is incredible. But... We, we essentially bought in products and we thought, what's the market going rate for it? What can we get for it? What's reasonable? What would I pay for it? What would my mum and dad pay for it? You know, And, and that's really how Bob and Bird started. I would ask mum and dad, how much do you pay for a freshly baked scone? And they would tell me, mm-hmm. you know, how much is coffee in Starbucks? Well, it's this amount. Okay, well, I think we can get that in Bob and Bird. So it was never based on, you know, profit margin, what we did you get to. It was kind of based on what we thought the customer wanted or what the customer would pay. We kind of need a bit of both, but... It's amazing to think that you got that far based on that strategy and it gives yeah. you hope that actually for people who don't know aren't aren't good at numbers, you actually can still succeed but there will be a time when you need to bring in the professionals, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And then David joins us said and we opened all these stores together and then we got approached in about 2016 it was by private equity. I mean, you had this conversation, you were like, you didn't know what private equity was and I was like, what is it? tell me what that means. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't know what it was, but essentially we were, we were approached by an investment company who said, look, we love what you're doing. We'd love to invest money in your brand, your business. And I suppose the hope for them is is that the money they put in, they'll get out plus a lot more in the future. Um, I like Ian. And, and I just wanted to let everybody know, this guy just walked into your coffee shop because he had a holiday home in Port so Stewart, wasn't it? The story is, yeah, it's a guy, Padre Graham, who worked for BGF and he had a holiday home. And BGF is? A business Growth Fund. Business, everybody write that down, Business yeah. Growth Fund. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, he had a holiday home in Port Stewart but lived in Scotland and seen Bob and Burst and came in and loved the whole concept of it. And I think he made a few inquiries and a guy got in touch with us from Deloitte, a guy, Matt McCulloch, and said, look, I did, I did the Bougian deal a number of years ago when they um, sold their business. Um, I've, been, I've been asked by this private equity company, do I know you? And I happened to know Matt through rugby and he said he did. Got in contact and we met with him and they said, look guys, love what you're doing. You know, you're at 14, 15, 16 sites in Northern Ireland, but we think this has traction to go across the UK, which is mind blowing for me because you kind of think to yourself, I lived in Leeds, how? I lived in Leeds, I lived in another place in, in England as well. How can this possibly go from Port Stewart to Belfast now over across the water? You know, it's just, it's very hard to understand how that, that journey is going to happen. Um, but when you sit down and think about it and you look at it, you think to yourself, well, these other companies can do it. So like, why, why can't we? You know, I mean, we've had loads of business come this way. We've had the Starbucks, the Nero's, the, the Costa Coffees, the McDonald's, you know, come from America. It's all happened. So it can't be that difficult. And that was kind of the ethos we had is, you know what, well, we'll just give it a crack and see how we get on. So BGF did a lot of poking around and they end up, they invested £2 million in our business and said, look, we think you can push this on across the water. Um, Scotland seems to be um, quite similar in Northern Ireland in terms of culture, in terms of food tastes, in terms of size of towns, villages, cities, and all that. So that would be a natural progression, you know, and down the end eventually. So we took that investment in 2017 and um, since then, we've been rolling out stores across the water. How many is there now? So we've got six in Scotland and we've got five in England. And how many here? Uh, there's 15 here. You're good at numbers now. How many that until we about 28? So 26. 26. And we have another brand uh, called Three Kings Coffee. I'm not sure if you know that. I don't know it, no. So it's based up in Portia Promenade as well. Okay. Um, 
and it's just a one-off. And the theory behind that is that's kind of we do all the tests sites for Bob and Bird, so we do all the tests and the food there. But it's a it's a coffee shop and brand in its own right. Yeah, I would watch this space. I think is is what we're hearing there. But so the investment came two million yeah. rolling the my dot over um, England and Scotland. You did talk about never getting days off and missing your family and mm. working late night. Yeah, yeah like this doesn't yeah. come. This success does not come without. No, it doesn't. And you know, people say to me, "Oh, you know, you've got all these sites now. You know, you must be amazing." But like, I'm not. Like, I'm not. I'm not very talented. I'm sort of just average. Just work very, very hard. And that's one thing my wife always said as well. You know, she was very, very supportive in the early days. You know, go and work seven days a week. And with a young family then, I mean, my oldest son's fifteen. Um, Bond Burst is going 10 years but I had the other stores before that so I was working 7 days a week for I don't know for, for years you know and you do you miss out on your family you miss out on your boys going to play football on Saturdays because Saturday's a business day in the coffee shops and you know you miss out cleaning the train as well as you're having to clean a shop somewhere and fix the toilet you don't fix the toilet <laughs> and do the plumbing and you know all of a sudden you're a bit of an expert and uh, electrician and all that kind of stuff which you just kind of have to get on with because there's nobody else, no one's going to do it for you, you know. So you have to either crack on and do it yourself, or sit with broken tills and broken fridges and all that. So yeah, very much it was very very hands on the early days, and we still are. Mm-hmm. Both David and I work in stores quite frequently. Um, we open new stores. We spend four or five weeks there together. You know, we really make sure that we we know the the store we're going to open. We know the local vicinity. We know all the regular people, all the different retailers around us. We spent a lot of time doing that, and then we opened. We spent a lot of time opening these stores too, and making sure we're there to understand how the store works. Every every store is different, yeah. you know, in terms of when it's busy times of day. I mean, one can be really busy in the morning, and day in the afternoon, vice versa. One can have a great lunchtime trade, others is terrible, but it trades really well all day, you know. So it really is different. So the operation needs to be slightly changed for every every store we go to. Yeah, and you talk like obviously the biggest challenge I think at hospitality at the moment is the rising costs of everything yeah. and every business. But God, hospitality have been hit hit hard. Just, yeah. Um, and I read a a piece that you did recently where you talked about it was a significant saving in money. We're talking like thirty seven thousand pounds by taking out a slice of bacon. Yep. Tell us about that. So, like I said, when we first started, we had no idea about profit margin. We didn't know what our what our margin was on dishes, but. I mean, I know that. So what we've done is we've we've gone away and looked at what we're what we're buying things at, how much food we're giving out, and we sort of come to the conclusion that a lot of our dishes is maybe too much bacon. So we decided, well, what if we take one slice out? If we took one slice out, what would that be? And because of the scale of the business now, it's thirty seven thousand pounds a year by taking out one slice of bacon out of a dish, you know. So and again we test that. So we made the decision, test it in the site, and we told our customers we're actually giving you a little bit less bacon here. Let us know what you think, you know. And the feedback was, and we didn't notice, or actually there was always too much on anyway, you know. So getting that real feedback from customers and asking the question, and one of our values is being open and honest, and that's why when we do change something, we are very open and honest with customers and tell them, look, there is a little bit less than that. What do you think? You know, if you need something, if you need more, let us know. And customers, as you well know, and in hospitality, they are very, very honest with you. Um, so yeah, that's sort of, that's how you make the decisions. Any other tips for businesses listening on how they could look at their costs or what they could be doing? Yeah, and look at your costs because yeah. that's one thing I, I never did, you know, and people would say to me, Well, how much are you paying for bins? I, I, I didn't know. You know, how much are you paying for for blue roll? You know, we go three tons of blue roll a year in, in bomb birds. I didn't know because it's one of those things that you just need. But when you actually look at it and you check it out and think to yourself, Well, I wonder can we reduce that? So things that for blue roll was it's now one pill. You know the toilets you get like one pill toilet roll. Yes. So it's now one pill blue roll. So rather than the girls and the the guys pulling out reels upon reels of blue roll, the pill had only the one bit of it. You know what I mean? So save loads of money there. Blue roll. Everybody listening, look yeah. at your blue roll. <laughs> but yeah, that's just one example. Yeah. I mean, right down to you know technology as well. So we brought in now screens in kitchens. So traditionally in in a, in a hospitality venue, the uh, when you put something through the prints out in the kitchen, ours now on a screen. So it comes up on the screen and the, the chefs can now see it's quite big and it's now a, it's a big 55 inch screen so now I see the order. But there's no paper now. So we're now saving thousands upon thousands of uh, a year on paper. Um, wow. Just by doing that, you know. So when you look at, you know, people think that, you know, oh, Bob Burst is fine, they can afford to use loads of blue roll and loads of paper out there. But whenever you actually look at it and break it down, 
you know, we save a lot of money by making little minute changes. Um, and Toro is a good example as well, where he went from having standard Toro rolls to one pills. Mm -hmm. And uh, you wouldn't believe how much money we save on that too. <laughs> but it is, it's interesting. I think a, a, a business owners don't understand the intricacies of how much they're spending yeah. on like insurances and, you know, electricity and all of that there. So maybe the people listening to this, they maybe sit down and have a look at their costs and see what they can pull back on. And, you know, when they do save thousands, they'll go and buy a wee cup of coffee every week and Bob and Bert's with their extra money. Well, that's so I think of you and yeah. um, helping them save money. Um, Colin, I could... I honestly talk to you all day. There's so much more. Maybe you'll come back in the podcast again and we'll focus on particular topics. But I just wanted to introduce you to people and hear the story. And it's so refreshing to hear that there wasn't that like business degree with all these, you know, qualifications that you can succeed in business with passion and determination and yeah. and drive and being a nice person by the looks of it as well. But have you any advice for business owners who like everybody is listening is trying to get a little bit of success in their own. Everybody's um, definition of success is different and it could be contentment sometimes as well but what would you say to people who are struggling and are trying to make it happen in their own business have you any words of advice yeah I would just say you know be honest with yourself and ask yourself why you know why do you want to be successful why do you, is it because you personally be successful or is it because you want your business to be successful is it you know be real authentic in it so people open business because they want to be make a difference so if that's the real driving factor, you'll be okay. Um, so just always, we always ask ourselves why in Bombers, why we do other things, you know, and that's that's one thing in our office we always talk about is w w why we changed this or why we not changed it, you know, and that's what really drives us on. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Dick Podcast. Um, if anybody wants to follow the journey, how do they find you now? Um, you're on LinkedIn. We're on LinkedIn. Yeah, I am on LinkedIn, Bombers LinkedIn. We're on social media. We're on TikTok. We're on Twitter. We're about to start Be Real if you're on that. So Okay, where you gave you all the platforms. Um so it's just Bob and Birth. Um, yeah, Bob and Birth's coffee, yeah. Bob and Birth's coffee. Yeah. So we'll be following the journey, see where else in the world Bob and Birth's is gonna pop up. And the next time you walk up past one in your local tag, be sure to thank a Colin on his story and um, go in and show the support for a, a small business owner really at the start that has achieved great thing. Thank you for being our guest today. No problem, thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Dig Podcast. It's an absolute privilege to be your host every week and to spend time with the most driven, inspirational people. Don't forget to tag us on social at Dig for Success if you enjoyed this week's conversation. And until next week, keep taking those steps to making it happen in your business and in your life.